Hey, before we begin, I think there's some prayer requests we need to be thinking about. I don't know how much news you are hearing in China, and I'm not talking about the virus, but it includes that. Uh, The government is really cracking down. Churches have all been closed. People are being arrested. All uh, workers have had to leave the country. Uh, I mean, it's a very difficult situation. And we need to pray for them. I mean, it, we don't realize how privileged we are to be able to come here and worship and not worry tomorrow morning to be hauled off to jail. But I'm going to suggest to you that day is coming. Amen. And we need to be praying for them. And in the country of Burundi, uh, our workers have been arrested. The union president is in jail right now. We're praying that he will be released, but there doesn't seem to be any hope in sight. The government has turned. I've seen some videos where government forces have come into Adventist churches and have arrested congregations, beaten them. I don't know if you've seen some of that. But guys, we need to pray for these people. Uh, A few years ago, a couple years ago, I visited one of the refugee camps in Rwanda that was a Burundian refugee camp. There were 55,000 refugees in that camp. 20,000 of them were Seventh-day Adventists. These are our brothers and sisters. We've got to remember them in prayer. Does that make sense? Yes. We're going to be having a town hall meeting in March. I hope you come to the town hall meeting. The purpose of the meeting this year, we, we do a lot of town hall meetings, but this year we're trying something a little different. We're not coming with a lot of presentations that we have used to do. We used to have all kinds of presentations on the camp and different departments on education. We're coming primarily to receive questions. So you can go online to the Facebook of Iowa Missouri Conference and you can read departmental reports and you can see what's happening. Then bring your questions to the town hall meeting. We'll do our best to answer whatever questions you're asking. So there'll be a devotional, a very short uh, state of the conference where we're at with finances and that type of thing. Then we're opening it up for questions. If there are no questions, it's going to be a short meeting. But we will stay as long as there are questions to ask. If we don't know the answer, we'll just say we don't know, and then we'll try to find out the answer to the question. Does that make sense? So I hope you come. Take your Bible. Turn to Luke. Chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Beginning with verse 1. Luke chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. The the sermon today, guys, uh, the study, isn't going to be an easy one. I hope it is one that will challenge us. That will help us to be stirred in our hearts. So I I want to begin with verse 1. It says, In the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, First of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Now, as you're looking there, what is the leaven of the Pharisees? It's hypocrisy is what he says. There's no guesswork there. Jesus says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Well, first, who are the Pharisees? Talk loud. 
Okay, so Pharisees are, uh, we could say, Jewish le leaders. But Pharisees was a sect. In other words, the Jewish nation was primarily made up of three groups. The largest two were the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They were arguing all the time over everything. I'm glad we've grown past that, aren't you? If you see a state of affairs, whether it's in the local church, whether it's in a conference all the way to the general conference, if you see a state of affairs where it seems like there's just two groups arguing with each other over everything, beware of that. Stay out of it. Don't get in big fights and arguments, guys. That is not the religion Jesus has given us. And Jesus is warning them in his day, beware of this type of religion. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. It is hypocrisy. Now, I think it's easy for us to read that and say, oh, hypocrisy. We know what hypocrisy is. So somebody give me your idea or thought of what you think hypocrisy is. Two-faced, right? I don't know that we could do any better than that definition. That we would say it's, you know, we may say one thing, but then do another thing, right? So I, I want to just test that a little bit. So if somebody um, this afternoon or something is driving home and you go by a corner and there you see me walking into a store. And you say, well, that's kind of interesting. I wonder what's going on. So you slow down and just kind of wait. Then you come out of the store and you see me have a bag and I'm just frantically opening that bag and pull out a pack of cigarettes and I'm tearing off the top of the cigarettes and I'm getting a cigarette out, in your mind, would you say hypocrite? Yeah, see, I think that would be our natural tendency. That would be my natural tendency. I'm using myself as the example because I don't want to offend any of you. But if it was you and I was driving by and it was just reversed, I'd probably say in my mind, man, hypocrite. Of course, as a good Adventist, what we would do is drive home now as quickly as possible so we could get on the phone and say, we need to pray for Dean in a special way. Man, I just saw, see, we, we sanctify that. In fact, we probably need to get the whole church praying for him. In fact, we probably ought to get the whole conference praying for him. So let's have a phone-a-thon. See, we do that kind of stuff. But I want to give us a caution. If you said, which we rarely do, but if you said, wait a minute, this isn't right, something's wrong, and you pull over, get out of your car, and walk up to me and say, Dean, what is going on? And I look up and say, praise God. God has sent you. I'm in the struggle of my life. Will you help me? Would you step back and say, hypocrite would you do that no I wouldn't either so I want us to think about this carefully the struggle against sin is not hypocrisy and there may be people here that are in the struggle of your life seeking to gain victory and Lucifer is whispering in your ear, hypocrite, hypocrite. You have no, 
right to pray to Jesus. You have no right to go to church. Hypocrite. Don't listen to that voice. It's the voice of the devil trying to defeat you. Struggling against temptation is not hypocrisy even when you fail. If you're in a struggle and you fail, rely upon the Word of God where Jesus says, if we confess our sin, He is faithful and willing and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I have seen people sink under their Christian experience because of hypocrisy, especially young people. Young people, the struggle against sin is not hypocrisy. And when you fail, go to Jesus as quickly as you can. Asking for forgiveness. He will forgive you. He will never hold you off. It's us as humans that say, I'll forgive you in a year if you haven't done anything wrong. That's us. Jesus never does that. Ever. Does that make sense? So I think when we look at this verse and we say there's a warning about hypocrisy, don't immediately say we know what hypocrisy is. You never know until you have the private conversation with somebody asking, can I help you? Can I pray for you? Can I? Now, now, it might be a little different when you run up and say, Dean, what is going on? This isn't right. And I, what, what are you talking about? Well, I saw you, no, no, man. Oh, oh yeah, I'm, I'm getting this for somebody else. I mean, there's somebody on the street corner. I mean, if I'm coming up with some elaborate story, yeah, you might get a little closer to hypocrisy. Never look at someone as a hypocrite until you have a private conversation asking, how can I help you? Does that make sense? And yet Jesus says, beware of the Pharisees. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Beware of hypocrisy. So he must be talking about something. Well, if you just turn over to Luke chapter 13, beginning with verse 10. It starts off with saying, Now he, being Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity of 18 years. So whatever's happened, it's been for 18 years. As you read the scripture, what is the problem? Just say it loud. It's right there in the Bible. So just read the next couple verses. What's the problem? She couldn't raise up. She was bent over. She was like this. And it's been like this for 18 years. How pleasant do you think that is? I mean, if I just did this for the next 20 minutes... It isn't going to be very comfortable. Because if I'm going to look at you, what do I got to do? I mean, I just got to be doing this all the time. It's a strain. And what I'm going to be in is chronic pain. Chronic pain that never leaves me. I'm there every day. When I get up, I'm in pain. When I go to bed, I'm in pain. Has anybody here ever experienced chronic pain? Yeah, there's quite a few hands up. I'm telling you, chronic pain is different than having a broken arm. I mean, I've had broken bones. Some of you have too. It's very painful. It hurts. But you know what? In a few weeks, that pain is gone. 
But chronic pain is there every moment of every day. And this has been for her 18 years. I'm surprised she's even coming to church, to tell you the truth. Man, I talk to people who don't come to church because they're tired. Not a lot, but some. Mostly I talk to people who don't come to church because they don't like you. And you don't like them. So probably we ought to just work out a schedule. That one week you stay home and they get to come to church. And then the next week you come to church and they can stay home. Because we can't tolerate to be in the same room with each other on Sabbath. Now I know I say that jokingly a little bit. But I'm telling you that is what happens among us. This woman's been in chronic pain for 18 years and she's still showing up to church. Jeez, the service has already started. Jesus is already speaking. And here she comes in, walking in. I wonder what people are thinking. Nobody says anything. I'm not going to read the whole passage because you can read it as I'm talking, but you'll see that I'm sticking right with it. What does Jesus do? Man, she doesn't ask for anything. She's just walking in as her habit for 18 years. She walks in. What does Jesus do? He stops the sermon. And he says, daughter, woman, woman of Israel, daughter of Israel, I release you from your infirmity. Can you believe it? I release you from your infirmity. What does she do? I'm a patient man, so I'm not moving on until we have an answer. She stands up straight. First time in 18 years, this woman stands up and pain is gone. What do you think about that? If somebody walked in here and had a problem and we just stopped the sermon and just said, in the name of God, whatever the problem is, that your problem is gone, how would you feel about that? Would you be happy to be at that service? Amen. Maybe another person would walk in. Would you be happy then? Maybe it's 10 after 12 and the sermon still hasn't been happening because we've been taking care of people's problems. Are you now saying, come on, give me a break? Would we be there? See, I don't think we would. I think we would rejoice in that. But somebody tell me, what did the religious leaders say? What was it? Yeah, so what did the religious leaders say about that? But the ruler of the synagogue answered with, What's the word indignation mean? If somebody's indignant, what's that mean? Say it loud. They're angry. They're offended. Have you ever been indignant? 
I have. Most every time that I can think of when I've been indignant, later on I had to repent. So for me, being indignant hasn't paid off too well. Usually I recognize that I'm the one that's got the problem. But this religious leader, now I want you to get the picture. This religious leader is watching, Jesus is talking, a woman that this man has seen over and over and over again. He knows the story. Eighteen years, comes into the service. Jesus puts his hand on her, and for the first time in 18 years, she stands up pain-free. He's mad. Does that make any sense to you at all? It does not make any sense to me at all. But he's mad. Look what he says. Now, he doesn't talk to Jesus, but he says to the people. And he says to the crowd, There are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. Now Jesus is going to answer him. And what's the first word out of Jesus' mouth? Hypocrite. So if I want to know when Jesus says, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, hypocrisy, I can now look at a story where Jesus says this is hypocrisy. You're a hypocrite. So I spent quite a time going over this, trying to figure out, well, what is the hypocrisy? The guy is trying to keep the Sabbath. Are we not trying to keep the Sabbath? The man is saying the Sabbath needs to be holy. The Sabbath needs to be guarded. Why does Jesus call that hypocrisy? So what's the example Jesus uses to him? So when Jesus talks to him, how does Jesus demonstrate it? Look right there in verse 15. Yeah, so he's referring to what that religious leader did that morning, right? So Jesus says, hypocrite, did you not this morning untie your ox or your donkey and lead them to water so that they could drink? And I'm assuming give them something to eat. Now, if you read this in other passages, uh, Jesus will even expand it beyond that. Because he will say, which of you, if you have a donkey or an animal and they fall in a pit on the Sabbath, what do you do? Don't you get them out of the pit? Don't you do whatever is necessary to do something for that animal to help them. Now, I think we can just see this plainly, but I just want us to wrestle with it a little bit. Because Jesus is going to say, Is this woman not more important than a donkey? What do you think the answer to that is? What do you think the right answer is? Certainly. Certainly, this woman is more important than that donkey. But why does the religious leader not see that? I mean, that's so obvious to all of us. Why doesn't he see that? I mean, do you think he's an animal rights activist or something? 
Why doesn't he see it? Now this is where this is going to get hard. That woman is nothing to him. That donkey is something to him. What is that donkey to him? Transportation. It's an asset, right? I mean, if something happens to that donkey, it's going to cost him, right? So he values that donkey because it serves him. Do you see that? That woman is nothing to him. Why? Because he's not getting anything from her. In fact, she's a burden. I mean, she's always stumbling around. She interrupts the church service just at the wrong time. She's just, you know, it's just a burden. Boy, I hope those in need are not a burden to us. Hypocrite. Do you know they had a law on their books that if you were on your way to the synagogue and there was a Gentile woman who had fallen into water. I've read this and was drowning your duty was to go on to church and when the sun was down go back to the river and if she still hung on then get her out of there then other than that let her drown would you say that's making sacredness of the sabbath I mean, what do you think you would say to God in heaven? Hey, we're honoring your Sabbath. Do you think God's going to accept that? God is not going to accept that. So here's where it's going to get close to us. Hypocrite. So I'm still struggling. Why are you saying hypocrite? Well, for one, you value your stuff as more important than the people around you do you think it's possible that leaders can value something more than the congregations or the people we are serving it's hypocrisy it is hypocrisy We should love each other. Amen. Nothing should be more important than helping each other. Relieving each other. But I got a question. If it was that Pharisee who was walking into church and he was just bent over or had a pounding migraine headache. I've never had one, but I've talked to people who have, and you can't hardly see. You can't hardly think it hurts so bad. You have to cover your eyes and lay down. Some people vomit. Has anybody here ever had a migraine headache? Am I describing it rightly? So you come walking in with a migraine headache, and Jesus stops the service and he looks at the Pharisee and says, I can see you're in pain. Pain, go away. You are free. Before he gets that, I see you're in pain, do you think that Pharisee is saying, ah, wait, it's the Sabbath. Don't heal me. You think he's saying that? I don't think he's saying that either. So my question now is going to get closer to hypocrisy. Why would he think it's okay for Jesus to heal him but not her? Because he thinks she's, he's better than her. He thinks he's more important than her. He thinks 
that he is more deserving of the favor of God than this woman is. And that is hypocrisy. And if you're sitting in this church service, husbands, thinking that you're better than your wife, the word comes to you, hypocrite. And guys, I don't care what the circumstances are. If you think you're more deserving of the favor of God than another human being, even if that human being is your enemy, your religion is hypocrisy. Do you understand what's being said? There's no place for hypocrisy in the religion of Christ. You say, well, none of us are like that. It's true. It's true. See, if I go look in the mirror, I'm saying, boy, that does not describe me. But if I spend time watching you, I could say, oh, it does describe you. It just doesn't describe me. How can I know? Here's how I can know. When you sin, do you ask Jesus to forgive you? If you do, raise your hand. I do that. When I've done wrong, man, I ask Jesus to forgive me. I'll tell you guys, I want to go to heaven. Amen. Man, all this stuff that we do, it is not important to me. I want to go to heaven. I, I, I don't want to show up and find out that I have not even been a Christian. I've just been this cultural, make up my own religion. I want to go to heaven. I want to have these scriptures have an impact on my life. So when I get on my knees and I ask Jesus to forgive me, what do I want Jesus to do? I want Him to forgive me, don't you? Amen. And I'm telling you, stuff that I've had to ask for forgiveness for is not, oh, I bumped into somebody's car, please forgive me. I wish Gail could be here with me today so she could help say, oh, man, my goodness, guys, he's had to ask, confess, and ask for forgiveness. Bumping cars is nothing for what this guy's done. It's true. I'm going to end. I can see I've gone over. But I'm going to tell you, here it is, as blunt as I can make it. Dear Jesus, please forgive me. And I say, please, here's what I've done, forgive me. Then I get up and I go out. And Gail says, Dean, I'm sorry, supper is burned. And I'm mad. You always do this to me. Can't you ever get anything right? On you, at that moment in heaven, Jesus is saying, hypocrite. When you ask for forgiveness of sin, asking Jesus to forgive you, and you refuse to forgive somebody else. Your religion is nothing more than hypocrisy. Because you then think that you're deserving of the forgiveness. Somebody else is not deserving of the forgiveness. That is hypocrisy, guys, and that gets pretty close to us. If we have difficulties in a church, I'm telling you the first claim of Christianity is forgive one another. Amen. Forgive one another. Amen. Yeah, but they did it the day before. Forgive one another. 
See, you, you think, is this real stuff? What do you think Peter is saying when he says, Jesus, how often should I forgive my brother? Seven times? And he thought he was stretching it right there, which tells you he's already mad at somebody. Right? Probably James and John. What's Jesus say? Not seven times. Seventy times seven. Now I'm telling you, if you've got a little black book, wife, and your husband's name's written there, and you put marks down till you get to 490, man, you have missed your calling. You should be an accountant. In other words, the point is we ought to keep forgiving, right? And when a person repents, forgive. When a person repents, forgive. Parents, weed out of your talk to your kids. You always Amen. weed that talk out. You're making your religion hypocrisy. Freely forgive your children. Help them to know they're forgiven. Help them to know Jesus will always forgive them. We need to shake off hypocr hypocritical Christianity. And it ought to be reflective in our churches. When people come in here, it shouldn't be, oh, you're here, I'm going home. Get together, pray it through, forgive one another, or quit coming. Because your religion is worthless. It is hypocrisy. My intent is I want to be saved. And true religion is I want my worst enemy to be saved too. I want to walk together with them into the kingdom of heaven hand in hand. But that's the way I want to live on this earth. Forgiving one another. He has shown the old man what is good. What does the Lord require of thee? To do justly. Love mercy, walk humbly with your God. If you have a difficulty, get it taken care of. Jesus is coming soon. Amen. Don't show up with anger and bitterness in your heart. Because as you forgive, God forgives you. That's what the scripture says. What is true religion? And undefiled. James 1, 27. That we would visit the fatherless and care for the widows or the weak among us. I'm almost done. I just want to make one more point. What's the scripture say? Jesus says, it is it not lawful to do good on the Sabbath day. Then this passage of Scripture, if you read it in other places, ends with the Pharisees getting together saying, how can we kill him? How can we kill him? And I've struggled with that for a long time. Saying, oh my goodness, you may not like it. Man, when was the last time you saw somebody breaking the Sabbath and your first thought was, let's kill them? Has that ever even crossed your mind? No, me neither. So even if they thought Jesus was breaking the Sabbath, why are they now saying we've got to get together and decide how we're going to kill him? For the sake of time, I'm just going to tell you what I believe. If Jesus would have said it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath day, and if you don't know what it is to do, go ask the Pharisee. They would not be trying to kill him. Jesus would have been their hero. Because they get to define 
what is good to do and what is not good to do. But when Jesus says it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath day and he ends it right there, what's the implication? Who decides what it is good to do on the Sabbath day? It's you. You decide what it is to do good on the Sabbath day. And then you say, but I don't know. Then who should you ask? Me? Ask Jesus. He's the Lord of the Sabbath day. Amen. So if you don't know how to keep the Sabbath, go ask Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Take your direction from Him, not the church. And I'm not opposed to the church, but we're not the definer of the will of God. If you see a neighbor who's hurting and something's wrong, and the impression comes to you, I'm going to go help them. I'm going to go wash their dishes. I'm going to go clean her house. And that's the impression. Don't call me asking me if I think that's okay. Get on your knees, ask Jesus. And if Jesus says, yes, right now, go help her, then get up and go do it. And none of the rest of us ought to condemn that. Amen. Amen. We should not condemn that. It is lawful to do good. Go do it. Thank you.